and away we go in Super Bowl 43. Super Bowl 43 was played on Sunday, February 1st, 2009 between the Arizona Cardinals and the Pittsburgh Steelers and had a viewership of just shy of 100 million viewers. With an intense battle between the two teams waging throughout the entire game, it came down to the Steelers pulling off a victory with 35 seconds left on the clock. While many people were losing their minds throughout the game, this is the type of broadcast that had studio executives extremely excited because an engaged audience meant a higher viewership for their advertisements, which averaged $3 million per 30 second ad spot that year. But it also means that the network can promote whatever content they wanted to prioritize to a completely captive audience. So with the game coming up, NBC, the broadcaster of Super Bowl 43, had to decide which of their hot assets that they would push. So obviously, if you know the story, they decided to push The Office, their golden goose. But why promote a show that was well into its fifth season? Because from the top levels of the organization, they believed in what The Office was. With viewership hovering in the mid eight millions each week, it somewhat paled in comparison to dramas like CSI or Grey's Anatomy. So with this setup, NBC went to Greg Daniels and the other showrunners and told them about their shot at the big leagues. God, okay, it's happening. Daniels took this opportunity to heart. To not only have your show promoted during the Super Bowl, that was a big deal. But to have it air just a few moments after the closing ceremony, that was a huge opportunity. Meaning that this episode of The Office had to be the equivalent of the Super Bowl. And they had to pull out all the stops. They had to go big and they had to put it all out on the line. They had to win this one. And I knew exactly what to do, but in a much more real sense, I had no idea what to do. And the writer's room went abuzz with how to capitalize on this, with Daniels becoming just short of obsessed with hinging the entire idea of the episode on Jim losing Pam in a game of poker. As Gene Stupnitsky, a longtime writer for the series, shared, this was a very stressful time because Greg came in one day and said he had this big idea inspired by some French film he saw. Basically, the idea is that Jim would lose Pam in a game of poker. He was like the father of all of us, and we were like, Dad, your idea? We're not sure about it. But thankfully, Daniels came to his senses, and that's when the idea of a fire drill cold opening spread through the writer's room. The genius of the idea couldn't be discarded. What could recaptivate Super Bowl viewers like a literal alarm sounding off in their living rooms? Oh, what, is what is that? What is that? The fire shooting at us! <laughs> what is the name of the fire is going on? <laughs> I can attest that I wasn't aware that this episode was even going to air after the game. I was at a party and we were all still talking when the TV just started to be so loud that everyone in the room stopped talking and just watched the craziness of the scene play out. And this cold opening, it was crazy expensive. As Flannery noted, it was fun, but I also knew it was expensive. So it's like, don't F this up. Things can be replaced, Phyllis. People, human lives, however, can... I found a quote from one of the producers talking about a $12,000 stuffed cat replica to look like Angela's current favorite, Bandit. Say Bandit! And you actually can see it in the episode. They decided that they needed to secure the service of cat throwers, a service I wasn't even aware was a thing. And according to the Humane Society note at the end of this episode, no animals were harmed in the filming of Stress Relief. Though the original script did have Oscar kicking the cat as it was being thrown, but they felt that that would be a little too mean-spirited for Oscar's character. I've seen conflicting reports here, but according to Jeff Blitz, the director of this episode, two cats were actually used. There was one trainer standing in the ceiling to catch the first cat and another trainer to throw an identical cat back down. And there's so much to love in this four and a half minute cold opening. Like this incredibly crafted juxtaposition of Michael attempting to break the glass to save his life and Kevin breaking the glass to steal snacks. Which you can see them later while they're standing over Stanley. The empty machines are spotted again later. And for the rest of this episode, there is plywood over the windows when they're doing their talking heads. Randall Einhorn, the primary camera operator for the series, said that this was so much fun to shoot in spite of the pandemonium. With Jeff Blitz, the director, saying that the fall that Randall took here it wasn't on purpose, but he was fine and they all just went with it. And they ended up using that take in this sequence. This is the longest cold opening in the entire series, topped out at four and a half minutes. This sequence ends with a cliffhanger in an attempt to hook the Super Bowl viewers into watching how the rest of the episode plays out. Stanley, Barack is president! You are black, Stanley! And stress relief upped the ante in so many ways. But was it a good thing? 
That's just one of the questions I want to look at today. My name's Chris and we're reviewing every episode of The Office ever on my channel. And today, we're looking at stress relief. I've got to make sure that YouTube comes down to tape this. Which was written by Paul Lieberstein and directed by Jeffrey Blitz. It was viewed by 22.9 million viewers and currently is one of the highest rated episodes of The Office on IMDb with 9.7 out of 10. Your stress relief trivia is what is the name of the fake movie that Jim, Pam, and Nandy are watching during their breaks? All right, and as always, I run comment contests in these videos, answer the trivia first, spot out the Easter egg, and or leave the best emoji sequence summing up next week's episode and you'll get your name in that field guide. All right, and with that, let's see what makes us one tick. I understand nothing. Stress Relief is really well known for its cold opening, but the rest of the episode plays out like a similar hour-long episode of The Office, with the staff dealing with consequences of their actions, Stanley's return, and then the second half of the episode comprised mostly of this roast. I am talking about a roast! of Michael Scott. But the B plot of this one is primarily about Jim and Pam dealing with some drama with Pam's parents, with the story being conveniently framed around this fictitious couple and Andy's there too. They're catching things that are totally going over my head. In an episode of really shocking things. Oh my God, if you're wearing a dress, please keep your knees together. Nobody wants to see that all. Stunt casting is one of the most jarring things in stress relief. According to Eisenberg, the network was really insistent that they figure out a way to incorporate some celebrity guests into the show. Daniels was pretty opposed to any type of stunt casting. And in my interview with Robert Schaefer, we talked about this very topic. At that event, Carol Burnett is being honored. And so she says to Greg Daniels, I want to be on your show. Well, they asked Greg Daniels, are you, Carol Burnett wants to be on the show. Do you want to have, he says, we can't have her on this show. She'll destroy all the reality. I mean, she's way too big of a star to be on our show. And I was at the time I was going, Carol Burnett, let's get her. Let's put her to work for Bob Van, Transfiguration. Suspension of disbelief is a fragile thing. When we're used to seeing a small cast of relative nobodies, and then Matt Damon or Ben Affleck show up, interacting with our cast, it kind of crumbles the foundation that they've worked so hard to build. Kind of the way I felt when Matt Damon showed up in Ragnarok. The compromise they came up with was this movie. They were able to incorporate Jack Black, Jessica Alba, and Cloris Leachman in an over-the-top take on a love drama. When I need, I'm gonna need Using the drama from the subject of the film to propel the drama in-universe was an excellent way of incorporating guests, maintaining realism, and you know, not feeling like it ruined the story. And that story was up for debate in the writer's room. Since season five's weight loss premiere, Jim and Pam had been relegated to the background of the series. But seeing as how Stress Relief was a repilot, as Daniels was putting it, it wouldn't make sense to not spotlight the Jim and Pam relationship, which, whether we like it or not, was a major source of heart for the show. So in this, the hope was to hook newcomers the same way that these moments in season one were able to accomplish, with an emotional climax that just tugs on the old heartstrings. When you're a kid, you assume your parents are soulmates. My kids are going to be right about that. But let's talk about the comedy in this one. The first half of Stress Relief is by far one of the most jam-packed comedy fairs The Office has, with a cold opening followed up by four minutes of straight comedy dealing with the aftermath. <sighs> the city. I don't even know why this is one of my most quoted lines of the entire series. Every time I'm in a high rise, I say that line. Every time. I love it. But this scene leads us to another iconic scene in the series, the CPR training. First I was afraid, I was petrified. No. Not only is this entire sequence a killing field of jokes, it served as a really good introduction to all of the staff members, with every character taking on their most defining traits for a new breed of audience members. In other words, everyone here shows up as the most them they could possibly be. Michael is kind of an idiot. Okay, that's uh, hard to keep track. How many is that per hour? How's that gonna help you? I will divide and then count to it. Right. He's also kind of a jerk. I would want to live with no legs. How about no arms? No arms or legs is basically how you exist right now, Kevin. You don't do anything. Creed is Creed. You were in the parking lot earlier. That's how I know you. Andy's Andy. Uh, you uh, can't uh, tell uh, by the way how I use my walk. I'm a woman's man. Kelly likes attention. Where is it? Dwight's Dwight. He is an organ donor. He is. Yeah. Give me some ice in a styrofoam bucket. Here we go. 
And in reality, the entire staff really do care for one another. And then maybe one of the funniest edits in the entire series of The Office. Oh my Why would God. You... Why? Why? Oh my God. Can you tell me why you had to cut the face off the dummy? This kicks off a deeper subplot in which Dwight tricks his co-workers into signing his statement of regret. I state my regret. Some of his tricks are great. This meeting is mandatory. If you do not sign in, your name will not be counted. Thank you. Hey, this is your apology letter. But his first trick is removing Pam's painting from the wall and sticking his paper up for them to sign. Now take a lesson from Stanley and jog on up here and sign this, okay? Make a line. Let's form a line right here. As the plot develops, we get this great scene in the conference room where Michael, the stressing agent, attempts to relieve everyone's stress. Oscar? Would you reach over and touch his thing? That's what he said, right, guys, because of gay? Until Michael realizes that he's the problem and takes action. Solution is honesty, laughter, and comedy. Make fun of anything about me. Could be my race, could be the fact that I'm so fit, or I'm a womanizer. And this entire sequence is cringe city. And uh, whoever wants to come up and roast me, you may, okay. But it, just like the CPR scene before it, serves to give more highlights from the series and more insights on who these characters are. You ran over me with your car. You posted a picture of my bare boobs on the bulletin board with a caption that said, gross. Once every hour, someone is involved in an internet scam. That man is Michael Scott. Well, you know, Michael is a great delegator. He never does any work himself, ever. <laughs> and one time I walked in on him naked, and his thing is so small. If it were an iPod, it would be a shuffle. <laughs> one of my favorite things is if you listen carefully, Bob Vance yells out, yeah, when Kelly said she'd make out with a fridge. Before I would make out with Michael Scott. A turtle? A fridge? Yeah. Anybody from the warehouse? Oh, yeah. A wood chipper? Also, when considering if you're new to the series with this episode, you might be wondering, are these people just awful to Michael or not? Daryl's Rose seems to attempt to answer that question very simply. What's his name? I don't believe I have had the pleasure. Michael, I gave you a ride home last week and we spent an hour in traffic. But then, the laughs end, and we return to a real season one sense of cringe. Then, Michael tries to cope. I, um, I spent the afternoon in the park trying to feed the pigeons. I guess they all flew west for the winter. And everything about Michael's roast is incredible. I love it. It also serves to give more background on these characters as well as more character insights. Dwight, you're a kiss ass, boom, roasted. Pam, you failed art school, boom, roasted. Meredith, you've slept with so many guys, you're starting to look like one. Andy, Cornell call, they think you suck. <laughs> and you're gayer than Oscar. <laughs> boom, roasted. Boom, roasted. Michael, am I gay? And then he finishes his roast rebuttal at the office with this pretty heartwarming conclusion. God bless, God bless America, and get home safe. Yeah. But with that, let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kevin. I took a blow off class in college called stress management. The basic philosophy of the class was that in life, there's practically no way to live without any stress. Stress being defined as an emotional or mental strain as a reaction to difficult or demanding circumstances or stimuli. The idea of stress management then is the ability to understand what your stressors are, investigate how to remove these stressors from your life, which is fine unless the stressor is something you can't remove, like your boss. Oh, Here we go. Michael, Michael, let me would, get would you. you. Would you step back, please? Okay. So stress management then is all about how to cope with the stress you have. With a series of tips and tricks, these tips were the normal kind of things, including getting a good night's sleep, practice good breathing, meditate, and when necessary, medicate. Michael. You are the reason I drink. 
You are the reason I live to forget. And while I don't have any behind the scenes statements to back up what I'm about to say, I think it's pretty apparent in the interviews I did read, The Office had already become life to so many people who worked on this show. Reading the stories of chaos in the writer's room throughout season five, not due to infighting or people hating each other, but due to wanting to make the show everything they'd built it up to be, there was an immense amount of pressure mounting on everyone behind the scenes and in front of the camera to make this show incredible. And I couldn't imagine the stress that that gives, but add on top of that, the network coming and saying, so we're giving you this time slot directly after the Super Bowl. Why you calm down? Perhaps then the entire direction of this episode was born out of the stress that this very episode was creating. We see various attempts of relieving stress throughout the different staff members, like watching TV. You know, Lily was supposed to be Nicole Kidman, um, and it was going to be Sophie's mom, not grandmother. Playing music. What I hate about you. Attempting to gain perspective. I like to think about a spaceman on a star incredibly far away. And our problems don't matter to him because we're just a distant point of light and venting feelings. You pathetic, short little man. You don't have any friends or any family or any land. We see that most of the stress invoked in this episode is from characters who are taking things too seriously, like Dwight. Last week I gave a fire safety talk <clears throat> and nobody paid any attention. I am planning a bomb scare. Michael. That you are also stressed around me is that you are too intimidated to tell me what you really think. And Pam. What could Jim have said to make my dad want to leave my mom? And at what point in our marriage is he going to say it to me? The breaking point for the A-plot is Stanley not taking Michael's roast seriously. <laughs> Oscar! <laughs> and the result is just great. You're gay! Wow. And the turning point for the B-plot is when Pam deals with all the drama to find what the truth is. About how you feel when I walk in a room and about how you've never doubted for a second that I'm the woman you want to spend the rest of your life with. But let's rate this thing to see if it's really as good as that IMDb score makes it out to be. This is the worst. I'm not insightful enough to be a movie critic. Maybe I could be a food critic. These muffins taste bad. I think we need to own up to something here. Often in the office community, I've seen people criticize the second half of the series for relying on slapstick zany antics for laughs rather than the cringe and the realistic smarter comedy that the first half of the series is known for. I'd argue that though the series had been dipping into the crazy for a little while now. Into a lake. Goodbye, that was what totally ridiculous. Check really? this out. Oh God. A, a duel. Stress Relief is the episode that changed viewers' expectations. Today, smoking is gonna save lives. Pluck the lowest rated episodes from after Stress Relief, the ones that do rely on cringe and slow burn humor. Pun. Episodes like Welcome Party or Here Comes Treble, two of the lowest rated episodes of the entire series. We'll pluck them and drop them into season two or season three, and I'd argue their rating would go up. And I think that's because our perspectives changed. Obviously, this is subjective and open to debate, but to Daniel's point, this was an opportunity to repilot the show. But in doing so, I think he ended up redefining the office's DNA. But what isn't subjective is taking a look at the IMDb episode ratings. While Stress Relief is one of the best episodes in the entire series, gone are the days of the iconic one-off episodes like Office Olympics, The Injury, and The Negotiation. Roy, look out! Moving forward, the highest rated episodes are those in which major story events occur, like Company Picnic, The Garage Sale, and Goodbye Michael, and the last couple episodes of the series. And Ben Silverman concluded his questioning about this episode by saying that this was vital for the show and introduced The Office to a whole new audience. Again, this is a nice sentiment, but it's not what the data says. In fact, viewership was down on average after stress relief, with the highest the series ever had again was the 9.4 million viewing the Niagara episode. 
Now, of course, the series had found tremendous success in streaming, and these numbers are only indicative of how the initial viewers of The Office felt about the series during its run. So while this episode may be one of the best episodes, it definitely changed the very fabric of the series itself. But the question for me is, what do I do with an anomaly like Stress Relief? An episode that got so much love and care by everyone involved, one that spurred so much merchandise, so many gifts, so many memes. An episode that is on so many people's top 10 list, an episode that inspired this 10 hour long video of Michael feeding pigeons. I mean, a normal episode of The Office has one killing field in it, maybe. Meaning that there's one sequence in which the jokes come in rapid fire with a rhythm that is timed perfectly and the scene just works. Stress Relief, on the other hand, is a series of killing fields with a few breaks to demonstrate the drama and give us the feels. So what can I do but give both the cold opening and the episode a 5 out of 5? This episode alone is incredible. I might disagree with some of the decisions and the direction that this episode set for the series, but I can't take away from the amazing thing that is this episode. It is nothing but exceptional on every level. You can throw away those pills. You are cured. Actually, you better hold on the pills just in case. But that's just what I think about Stress Relief. What are your thoughts? Do you think this one's overrated? Do you think that it's five out of five material? Leave it in the comments. Don't forget about those comment contests, including the emoji sequence for next week's episode, which is Lecture Circuit. Hey, you know what's even cooler than Triceratops? Every other dinosaur that ever existed. Both of them. We're gonna do part one and part two. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>